A whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina ki nga ki uta, ki a mātaratara ki tai, he iaka ana te ātākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga, haumie e hui e tae ki e. A tēnā koutou katoa, ngau mai haramai, e tahi o koutou haramai ki konei, ngā tangata i roto i te ipurangi, kei te mihia tu ki a koutou. Kia ora, my name is uh, Tania Gerard. I'm the Principal Māori Advisor here at GNS, and I have been tasked with one, two, three very important tasks. The first one is to open um, our proceedings today or to um, open the celebration today with appropriate Māori karakia, as well as briefly explain the Indigenous name given to Zealandia. Secondly, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first and foremost, if the fire alarms go off, or if there is um, an earthquake, we do ask that you proceed out those two exit doors. We did have a look at that one. It does go outside, so we're quite safe with that one. If When you are outside, we do ask that you come around the corner to um, um, our big car park there. Um, and also to let you know, just in case you didn't see them on the way in, toilets are out that door. Um, now, as I said in the start, I talked about an indigenous name for Zealandia. And the reason why I used the name um, indigenous was that in naming Zealandia and all that the continent encompassed, we had to be very mindful that the name, whatever name we gave it, needed to be acceptable not only to Māori, but also to our Pacifica Farmo in the South Pacific. In order to get the appropriate name, uh, GNS approached uh, the Associate Professor Manuka Henari in Auckland University to recommend a, uh, recommend a name that reflected the nature and the position of the continent and the people that were associated with it. Uh, Manuka Henari came up with the name that we now have today, Derua Maui, um, meaning the hills, the valleys and plains of Maui. The word riu is defined in the Māori Dictionary as whole, of a canoe, hull, sorry, of a canoe, a basin, a belly, the core of a body. It is the whole that holds the sum of the parts together. And as a lot of you know, and thanks to Disney, Maui is an ancestor of all Polynesian. Um, he sailed and explored the great ocean and caught the fish, which he and his crew pulled up, which we now refer to as the Gamawi, the North Island. The fish became many of the islands we know today throughout the Pacific, um, as well as the North Island. And Te Rua Maui brings together the geological science and the traditional oral narratives of Maui's exploits, um, exploits across the Pacific Islands and across the Pacific Ocean. So now I will hand over to Adam Greenland, National Hydrographer from Land Information New Zealand that will um, take us through this morning. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, katoa. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you to uh, Tanya for that introduction. Um, so, yes, uh, I work at Lynn's Land Information New Zealand, the New Zealand Hydrographic Authority, uh, and my position is um, uh, National Hydrographer. So, welcome to you all uh, as you join Land Information New Zealand, GNS Science, um, and NIWA in marking World Hydrography Day 2020. So a little bit about the IHO then, the International Hydrographic Organization um, is an intergovernmental organization of 93 member states. And in 2005, uh, the IHO um, uh, made an application to um, mark um, 21st of June um, as World Hydrography Day. And that's recognized by the UN. Uh, and the reason for that is to increase awareness of the vital role that hydrography uh, plays in our lives today. So the focus uh, this year uh, is on the key role hydrography can play in support of uh, autonomous technologies um, to conduct hydrographic surveys for seabed mapping. So this would include autonomous technologies in terms of aerial surface and underwater survey systems. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So the program itself uh, that we have for you this morning is a series of presentations, demonstrations, products, uh, sort of show and tell uh, if you like, and that's from GNS, LINS and NIWA. Um, and we're going to talk to you about uh, seabed mapping uh, in New Zealand, both regional and uh, global. Um, and so um, we're going to talk to you about our activities and our, and our partnerships. Um, and so for your information and enjoyment, um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Jenny Black, who is the data technician, geospatial data and analysis team, GNS Science, um, for the launch of the new bathymetric and tectonic maps 
of the Earth's eighth continent, Te Rue Amari, uh, Amaui, uh, Zealandia. Thank you. Thank you. Tenokoto Katoa. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the new bathymetry map of Te Rue Amaui, Zealandia that I worked on with Nick Mortimer and Belinda Smith Little from our Dunedin office. They'll be speaking after me as part of the series of speakers we've got lined up for you this morning. This being a World Hydrographic Day event, I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with bathymetric maps. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes and highlight three things in this map that are different to previous bathymetry maps that GNS has published. Colour, data source and projection. I'll start with colour. You'll notice the colours are quite vibrant and designed to catch your eye and to pick out as many details as possible in the bathymetric map. You'll also notice we've chosen a continuous colour ramp from the top of the highest mountain to the bottom of the deepest ocean trench. Most bathymetric or topographic maps you'll be familiar with have two separate colour ramps, one for the onshore, one for the offshore component with an obvious break along the coastline. We want to take a step back here and view the entire continent as a single entity and the continuous colour ramp we think helps define the continent of Tereo Maui, Zealandia, most of which is currently submerged, but a small part, including the bit we're standing on today, is obviously above sea level. On to the data source. This map uses the JEBCO 2019 bathymetry grid. The first output from the Seabed 2030 project, supported not only by JEBCO, but by the Nippon Foundation in Japan. Those of you who were at this event two years ago may remember the launch of the South and West Pacific Centre of Seabed 2030. Later this morning, Kevin Mackay from NIWA, the head of the centre, which is hosted here in New Zealand, will be giving us an update and tell us what's happened in the last couple of years with that. But you'll notice when you look at the map in more detail, and I hope after this event you will go and look at the maps in a lot more detail, you'll see that there's a lot more features present in the bathymetry than previous versions and fewer artefacts as well, which makes it much more useful and nicer to look at as well. The third aspect I was going to talk about is projection. Previous um, GNS bathymetry maps have tended to be in a Mercator-based projection. The sharp-eyed amongst you today will have noticed that's not the case for this map. It's a Lambert conformal projection, or the New Zealand Continental Shelf projection, to be precise. After much debate, we decided this was a much better way to look at the continent, which covers such a range of latitudes, as it does a very good job of minimising distortions across the area. And that's true for both the bathymetry map and the tectonic map. So that's all I wanted to say about the bathymetry map. I'll now hand over to Nick Mortimer in our Dunedin office, who's going to talk about the tectonic map, the twin of this map. Over to you, Nick. Good morning, everyone, from the Dunedin office of GNS Science. My name is Nick Mortimer, and it's a pleasure to join you on World Hydrography Day. Jenny's said a few words about the bathymetric map and I'm going to say a few words about the companion tectonic map, what it is, who would use it, and why GNS made it. So what is a tectonic map? Well, tectonics is the study of the structure and deformation of the Earth's crust. So that's what it's made of, how plate tectonics has shaped it, both today and also in the ancient past. So Jenny has explained that the, the bathymetric map is a picture of the solid earth if you pull a plug on the world's oceans and drain everything away. This is what the solid earth looks like in terms of valleys, mountains, etc. The tectonic map goes one step further in that we also remove the seabed sand and ooze and mud. And we're, what we're left with here is the, the basic bedrock foundations of, of the solid earth. Now these are usually well hidden and in large part inaccessible, but they have been studied down the decades by, by geoscientists. And so we actually know quite a lot uh, at this general scale. You can see that there's a broad match in the, the colours and shapes between the two maps, and that, that, that's quite intentional. It's actually quite inevitable because the, the ridges and the valleys and plateaus of, of Zealandia and the Southwest Pacific are caused by the differences in the, in the geology and the fault lines in, in the crust there. Uh, it's designed to be a, a more technical map than the bathymetry map. Uh, the, the legend explains the various colours and uh, line work that are present on it. But from, from it's designed to work from both far away, like looking at where you're looking at the map, but also close up, getting your noses right close. There's a lot of detail there as well. 
But the, the one thing that we wanted to stand out and we think does stand out is our Earth's eighth continent, our new continent, Te Rio a Maui Zelandia. And it's outlined in the uh, orange and red and yellow colors here. As with the bathymetry map, the, the color map is seamless. It's very really hard to see New Zealand and New Caledonia um, coastlines, but they are there. And this emphasizes that, yeah, the solid earth geology doesn't just stop at the, the low water mark, it continues for a long way out. There's heaps more on the map. Maps are fantastic um, products. They're packed with detail. If you get closer, you can see various fault lines that, that point towards Antarctica and Australia when Zelandia broke away from Gondwana. There's information about plate ages, plate motions, more than 500 volcano locations. So lots of detail to see on here. Who's it mainly aimed at? Uh, it's mainly aimed at other geoscientists, but also educators, uh, map lovers. In fact, anyone who's interested in, in the natural environment would, will find a use for this map here. GIS people, uh, inevitably this will be the, the bottom layer of a GIS. That, that's quite appropriate for the, the foundation kind of layer. Why did GNS make this map? Well, first of all, as a tool to explain what we know, we, we, we do know quite a bit about the, um, the seabed geology. And this has accumulated over a number of decades. This is a, a better, more accurate map of the Southwest Pacific than we've ever had before. But the other reason we made it is to inspire the next generation of explorers and discoverers you see something out here, why is that? Ask questions and use this as a roadmap for, for new, new discovery and new science. So that's the, the briefest summary of the tectonic map. Uh, I invite you to pick a copy up and, and have a close look at it yourselves. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague in Dunedin, Belinda Smith-Little, who is going to talk about some of the technical details behind the making of these two maps. Belinda. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everybody from sunny Dunedin with a heavy frost. It's <laughs> lovely to see you all remotely. Um, one of our reviewers has called the pair of posters twins, full of potential. One particularly beautiful and the other one full of character. What we've tried to do in the presentation of both the posters and the web maps you'll see later on is to provide a great deal of information in a clear and pleasing form. But there is more to this project than a successful spot of cartography. I surprised one of, the co one of my colleagues in pointing out that there are internationally recognized standards for the transfer of earth science information and that the provenance in the form of useful metadata is actually required if we're going to turn these loose on the public and to have some use in further uh, information. We had to plan and build a data structure for these maps uh, that allowed us to deal with data from a huge variety of sources. We had to describe defining characteristics for each individual layer, whether it's a geological layer, whether it's a structural layer with the faulting, um, to be able to describe the source of the geochrons. We had to accommodate information that had been collected um, at various resolutions. We have some um, high we highly accurate directly measured, measured uh, readings of velocity. And we have depicted boundaries on these maps that were inferred from geophysical data. So the data records that we're providing had to indicate positional accuracy of a location and the confidence in the identity of a mapped feature. What we've come up with in the data set portrayed in the tectonic map and in the bathymetric map and in the web maps uh, is what we are launching today. We hope that we've been able to put together a useful compilation of what we know about the area around Tirua, Anawi, Zealandia in the year 2020. And as Nick said, to show where the gaps in our knowledge are that want to be filled. And 
there are any number of people that I think that will quite enjoy looking at the maps in their own right uh, and hopefully find the data that we've provided to support the, the data that we have provided to be useful. With that, I'll hand back to Vaughn in Avalon. Tina Koto, Kata people. I'm Vaughan Stenko, the um, <coughs> program leader for the Te Ruru Amaui Zealandia Research Program, which is a large underpinning research program at GNS, and um, which encompasses a lot of research on that continent that Belinda and um, Nick were showing you. I want to come up here today to present our uh, web viewer that we use for looking at data from the continent. It's one of a, a stable of web browsers that GNS use for data exploration. So you can see this link along the bottom. <coughs> it's a public web viewer, anyone can log in. Remember this link and take a note of it because you can, after this show, you can come in and have a look and play on this web browser yourself and let us, now, let us know what's not working. <coughs> and I, today I have Andrew Boys here to help me actually run that web browser. He's going to move over to the web browser now and uh, I'm going to sort of sh try, take you through it. Um, you don't need to be a young person, you can be a boomer like me <laughs> to actually operate this. But <laughs> it's a lot easier if he does it from, from, while I do the talking. So initially when you go to the web browser you'll see along the top there's a bar of tabs that give you quite a bit of information about the program and also most importantly where the maps are. So if you look at where he is, he's just scrolling through now and showing you the various tabs. Uh, he can go to say the getting started tab and that tells you a lot of information about the website and about how to use the web map. So that's a good place to start. It also has links to other pages on the website that shows you about how to get downloads and how a bit about the continent. Uh, that's a really useful resource that uh, Nick Mortimer has put together about that. So if we now move to uh, open some of the maps, you can see that we have a selection of four maps currently, but this can be changed this time. Uh, and two of those maps are the are the uh, hard are the digital versions of those hard copy maps that um, Nick and Belinda and Jenny just talked about. So if we open up, say, the Zealandia tectonic map. There it is. So as well as having a hard copy version, we have this in uh, in digital form. And the beauty about digital form is that you can actually interrogate it. You can see down the side here, there's a sidebar menu of all the information on that map. And Andrew will go down and he'll select the feature and we'll show you how you can actually go in and interrogate that. He's going to look at volcanoes. So you can see how he selects the volcanoes as a feature to interrogate. He's going to draw a polygon around them, which he's doing right now. And when he closes that polygon, up comes a pop-up win window that shows you the name of the volcanoes, a bit more information about them. If he scrolls right along to the right, you can see there's also web links in there that actually will take you to more information. And in this case, it's taking you to the Smithsonian Institute website that will give you more information on volcanoes in that case and for other objects on that map there's all sorts of other information whether they're sedimentary basins or fault lines and such like that you can go and resource okay and in, in terms of other web maps there's a bathymetry web map that jenny had showed you and also there is our main data exploration map which is this one here for uh, the program and so initially you can see there's a quite a lot of information on the opening page. If you zoom in on some area, we can now have a look at some of that information in more detail. So we're zooming in and having a look at Kaikoura. And so offshore, he can show you the uh, bathymetry data sources we have as an image. And also onshore, you can see this is the geology of New Zealand at a one to two fifty thousand scale. Uh, he can actually ch go to that geology of New Zealand and he can actually change the opacity of the layer. So he can dull it down or brighten it up quite easily. And it allows him to 
show other data underneath it or above it. And so at the moment he's showing us um, some geological data from Pet Lab, I think. And uh, we probably have time for you to go and have a scan of that and see where that <coughs> where that can. Um, he's drawing a. He's actually going in and collecting, doing it a bit of an interrogation on some of that data. And you can see here that he can actually go to the sample ID and that will take you directly to the pet lab information on that sample. So it's able for you to actually go in and interrogate that data. You might have also noticed there that there is a download option on a lot of these uh, layers. So you can actually download them as shape files or CSV files. That data is all public. Okay, so let's move to the offshore because it's World Hydrographic Day. And you can see here again, there are offshore data that he has. He can go and click, click on some of these data sources and look at one or two of them. And he can also actually turn off the imagery of the bathymetry and that allows us to see all the data sources for the bathymetry data. And he's now going through the process of selecting one of those sources clicking on it and finding out more information. In this case, it's a survey from the Nathaniel B. Palmer, which is a ship that came to New Zealand in this case in 2006, I think. He can click on that link and that will take you to the MGDS site in the US. And at that site, all that data is available and you can actually download that yourself. So the resource is there for you to interrogate the information and find out all the information you need to in the offshore region. Um, we also have the facility because this is a web map viewer to access web map services from other institutions. And so he's going through the process now of selecting web map services from other areas. So the New Zealand Library is the GNS library. Most of this is now uh, publicly available and available as a web service. But he can also, including the trams, including those tectonic maps that we saw before, and all of that data can be brought in and put on this map as well. But also he can sort of, there are external links to New Zealand Petroleum Minerals, DOC, NIWA, and so on. So for example, he can bring in the DOC Marine Reserves, he can go to the NIWA uh, and bring in the charts, the hydrographic charts, add those layers, and there they are, they appear like that. So you can now see where they are on there. And, and the, other, the ability of this too is also because he can go to the opacity layer, he can then change the opacity. And for example, in that marine reserve in the Kaikoura region, he can now look at, compare the data sources we have. If you, if you are from DOC, for example, you can then click on that, find the, find the source of bathymetric data in that region. And uh, he can change, go back and look at the maps there. I think that's quite a nice image of how, how bathymetry data has improved over the years. Okay, so the, the website, there is also down the left-hand side here, you can actually print websites, you can um, put on a graphicule, you can do a lot of other information that you can on that website. And so, it allows you to generate your map and and save it or print it. So one of the good things about this thing is you can actually also save that map to your web browser as you see it. And this actually, you can name it and you can save it as we see it. And so that is now saved and you can go back to that any other time. And the other advantage is we have this little thing called a permalink that actually saves a, a web, a web address that shows this exact map and you can just email that to anyone and say I was looking at this map I need this information or something like that so the permalink can be sent off to anyone and they can then click on it and open the map exactly as you see it um, so that, that's really a summary a quick summary quick tour of the of our um, database servers and our databases in the region uh, please help yourselves to have a look in here and let us know about any uh, glitches or problems you have. We're sort of working on this and it's in de development as we go. And any other web map services that want to be added to it, we can certainly do that as long as there are web map services. 
it's certainly a, a available for us to um, put on here. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all those involved in today's event, particularly those involved in building the maps and also the web browser technology. Phil Scaven was really important in the web browser technology. Jenny Black, Nick Mortimer and Belinda Smith-Little, Andrew Boys have all been involved in both the map and the web browser work. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank today's presenters, particularly those from out of GNS, that's Adam Greenland and Linz, and uh, Kevin Mackay from NIWA. Thank you very much for doing your presentations today. And the event organisers, Jenny, Katie, John, Shirley and the admin team, we couldn't have done without you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for that, Vaughan. Um, I think that's fascinating. Um, what uh, GNS has done there and uh, what you're delivering in terms of your maps and web browsers and the bathymetry in there is uh, quite startling when you get down into that detail and to see that detail now um, I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about LINS, the New Zealand Tidographic Authority um, and uh, what we do in our core business and some of the activities and partnerships um, that we have uh, uh, been in involved um, in and uh, what we've got coming up in the future. Um, but in terms of LINS as a government department, um, uh, hydrography is uh, an important part of, of, of LINS, but LINS is a lot bigger and wider than that in terms of um, its uh, uh, work that it does. And you'll be aware of uh, some of its other functions in terms of the Overseas Investment Office and uh, land online um, survey and title system as well. So it's a big organisation. Um, uh, LINS, uh, New Zealand Hydrographic Authority, it comes under the uh, location information uh, business group. Um, and so what we do is uh, traditionally we provide um, maps, uh, charts um, um, and services to meet international safety of life at sea. So that's uh, SOLAS obligations and contribute to global navigation safety. So we produce, we maintain and we distribute uh, our products and that includes our paper charts and also um, our hydrographic information. So our uh, uh, coverage extends um, to over across quite an area uh, and so we're producing nautical charts that um, extend from the southwest Pacific um, all the way through to uh, Antarctica. So you can see there there is a, a quite a big coverage um, for our products uh, and our products now as I mentioned um, whilst uh, traditionally paper products um, we now um, have a uh, digital first data centric focus um, and our future uh, ENCs uh, products are going to be produced for e-navigation um, and that's going to drive autonomous ships across oceans um, and into our ports as well. So seaborne trade is of critical importance um, to New Zealand and then you think about the New Zealand economy um, and in terms of our supply lines as well um, as uh, recently with the COVID um, uh, that's been uh, uh, highlighted um, how critical that is for, for New Zealand and our ports um, uh, important in terms of uh, imports and exports um, and uh, when you drink your cup of coffee in the morning um, those coffee beans will have been come in from um, uh, abroad um, and uh, by vessel by ship. So ships are getting bigger, deeper, um, underkill clearance is getting less um, and so we now require high accuracy, high resolution hydrographic surveys um, and we're producing uh, new products, high density bathymetry uh, ENCs um, and uh, LINS and Maritime New Zealand uh, have recently collaborated to develop uh, good practice guidelines for hydrographic surveying of ports and harbours um, in support uh, of the New Zealand uh, Port and Harbour Marine Safety Code. So in terms of our annual uh, mapping program, um, we have uh, High Plan um, and uh, we seek to partner with others. Um, and uh, over the last few years, we've partnered with the uh, uh, Marlborough District Council um, and we've done extensive surveys uh, in Queen Charlotte Sound, Torrey Channel, um, and more recently as well, Polaris Sound. Um, so uh, we work with uh, um, our supplier panel um, and we've worked with NIWA as well um, to deliver that uh, extensive range of uh, information and data um, and so traditionally that will be bathymetry um, and this is uh, uh, now full coverage at high resolution um, and uh, we're also um, 
producing more data now than ever before in terms of um, our sensors and that information as well is made available. So whilst we think about bathymetry and we're looking at coastal hazards for safety of navigation, um, uh, the data that we are providing is so much more. We're also working with uh, MFAT, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, and um, we have a, a program up and running called the Pacific Regional Navigation Initiative. And that has a focus um, on improving uh, nautical charts for our area of responsibility where we are the primary charting authority. And that's uh, Tonga, Cook Islands, Samoa, uh, Niue and Tokelau. Um, and we've recently completed extensive surveys um, in Tonga um, and um, Samoa and Niue. And that's included technologies such as technologies and methodologies such as satellite derived bathymetry, airborne laser bathymetry and traditional acoustic techniques um, uh, using uh, multi-beam uh, echo sounders. And uh, re, uh, the, the, the surveys of Tonga also included uh, use of uh, autonomous surface vehicle um, for um, seabed mapping uh, and that had uh, multi-beam acoustic equipment fitted to it. And that was a successful deployment, one of the first, first successful deployments of uh, autonomous vehicle um, within the region. LINS is also engaged in an uh, extensive uh, mapping program. So um, Mapping New Zealand 2025, um, and it draws on our extensive uh, expertise in mapping over the years um, as um, a hydrographic authority, topographic uh, national mapping series, and our geodetic colleagues as well. Um, and um, we are aiming for high resolution seamless mapping um, of New Zealand from the highest mountain, uh, Araki Mount Cook, uh, to our oceans. Um, and we're engaged with government in terms of the Provincial Growth Fund for Topographic LIDAR, and we're in partnership with regional councils to deliver that program, which is underway now. We also have a, a collaboration with NIWA in terms of joining land and sea, um, uh, where we're joining uh, land datum to sea datum to make sure we have that uh, seamless mapping, um, and NIWA are uh, in the process of building a, a new tidal model uh, for um, New Zealand. We're focused also on our critical area, which is uh, 3D coastal mapping of the intertidal coastal strip. And that is a challenging area for us, for any hydrographic uh, office um, or any uh, national mapping uh, organization. Um, and we are now uh, engaged in trials of using um, uh, uh, UAVs, uh, aerial drone autonomous vehicles um, to uh, map that area um, and to um, trail the technologies and, and results from that. So all our topographic LIDAR and seabed mapping um, through high plan um, is delivered um, in this program um, to create this seamless map and the benefits I think uh, for us in terms of coastal hazards we've talked to regional councils about their requirements uh, for the coastal mapping um, and the identification of hazards uh, long-term sea level rise inundation flooding planning engineering decisions retreat etc so all of that information from this mapping program will answer those questions. So we are also, as a hydrographic office, um, we're leading and facilitating the New Zealand Marine Geospatial Work Group, and that's bringing together a uh, community of central and local government, CRIs and users, um, to make effective use of high value geographic information, which is a key outcome for LINS. Um, and LINS has recently delivered a stock take of our own marine geospatial information. Um, as I've mentioned, there's a lot more information that we hold um, above and beyond bathymetry. Um, to make this information available under fair data principles. With those data sets uh, available on demand or by request through the LINS data service online uh, portal. So finally, um, I'd like to um, highlight our collaboration um, with NIWA and GNS um, uh, in terms of the Southwest Pacific Center for Seabed 2030, um, which is an ambitious global seabed mapping program. So I'd like you now to um, welcome up onto the podium, um, Kevin Mackay from NIWA, who is the Seabed 2030 South and West Pacific Centre Head. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Adam. Tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Adam has uh, mentioned, my name is Kevin Mackay. 
I am the current head of the South and West Pacific uh, Regional Data Centre for the CB2030 program. Can I get the... Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the progress we've made in the centre. Um, I'll do some introduction about what the project is about. But um, for those who view that were here two years ago at World Hydro Day 2017, we announced the launch of this project. So this is actually a, a progress statement since then. But the first important thing to note is our lovely new logo. Um, and to be, you guys should be honoured to know that, that you are the first audience in the world to see the new logo. It's got launched today. Um, and, and for those of you that were involved in the project in the last couple of years, you know there was a lot of resistance in the project to create a logo. So the fact that we've got one is quite amazing. So let's talk about GEBCO. So GEBCO actually stands for the General Bathymetric Charts of the Ocean. Um, and it has a history that dates back to 1901 uh, from Prince Albert of Monaco that had a great interest in the oceans and was um, quite upset that the at the time the holders of bathymetry were navies and they were pretty reluctant to release that information to, uh, to civilians. So he decided to um, create a GEBCO that was a way of actually making uh, free and open data um, charts and publications of the seafloor um, to, to the world. And it's been going on since then. Um, CB2030 is a side project and it actually started in uh, 2016 from a, the form of um, Forum for Future of Ocean Mapping, which Robin Fountainer, I think, is here. Yes, Robin, hands up. Full credit to you. He uh, he was one of the uh, lead instigators in this, this forum to decide what the future of ocean mapping looked like. And at the time, they decided that uh, when you actually looked at the maps of the ocean, and you could do a fantastic maps of the ocean, when you drill down to it, so little of it, it was actually had uh, real data behind it. Um, and so there was definitely a need to create a project to actually fully map the oceans. Then Jebco got together with uh, the Nippon Foundation in June 2017. They put together the money to, look to create the CB2030 project. And its ambitious goal was to create a Jibco project, a Jibco map of the oceans where 100% of it comes from real data. Just a, a quick uh, slide about the infrastructure behind it. But um, the critical, critical points to note that, um, that Jibco is actually a collaboration between um, uh, Nippon Foundation and Jibco uh, Guiding Committee. Within the, the CB2030 project, there are sub-regional centres. And that is because when you look at the world, the world's too big for one data centre to, do, to uh, look after. So we divided the world into four components. And I hate this slide. Um, this slide is built by Europeans and it's put the Pacific Ocean in half. But the biggest ocean in the world by far is the Pacific Ocean, which is the pink part. And that, uh, that whole ocean, the South and West Pacific, that includes all of uh, Asia and South America, um, is actually run by a data center that's hosted by NIWA, but it's run by joint uh, LINS, GNS, and NIWA. And our role at the center is basically X, X plus Y plus Z equals 100. Um, in simple terms, X is the data that JEPCA had already had when we started this project. Y is the data that has been collected already by various agencies, but is not in JEPCO. And Z is the part of the ocean where there is no data collected. So right now, since 2017, we've been in the Y. We've been out there going, knocking on doors uh, and saying, if you, you know, do you have data? And if you have, can you share it with us? Um, Right now, we're actually moving into uh, the second phase, which is where we've basically almost exhausted the Y. We're getting into the Z component of it. And there are three phases, uh, sorry, three parts of this phase two. The first um, way we're moving forward is called the um, Ocean Frontier Mapping, where we actually use things like the Ocean Grid to inform future mapping programs. We're using the grid to decide where are the gaps, and we're telling agencies to go out there and please go and map them. We are also uh, acting as an advocate for grading mapping activity to governments and industry partners. Plus, we also act as, a, as an agent, as a, as a means of identifying funding. So the CB2030 project itself isn't funding new, these new, uh, new, new mapping pro, um, projects, but we are help in facilitating finding the funding for this to happen. We're also advocating crowdsourced bathymetry. Um, and, and we're actually trying to really get people out there to um, collect their own data and, and share it with us. Now, crowdsourced bathymetry, 
CSB, the people don't, there was a pushback from the name and, and the new name that we're looking at is Volunteer Geographic Information. And the idea is that anyone with a boat and an echo sounder, we encourage you to turn on your echo sounder and log that data and share it with us. And that could be a commercial vessel, it could be a fishing vessel, it could be a super yacht, it could be a, a bloke with a, with a keeler. And there is actually a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm for this around the world. We actually have many agencies and many, um, even, even members of the public saying, I want to be part of this. How do I do that? And so one of the big pushes that the project is working over the next few years is how do we actually facilitate these people who are keen to do that? How do we get the data off their echo sounders and into databases? And the, the third part of the C, uh, phase two is about innovation technology. And about these new technologies getting out there that we've already talked about the autonomous surface vessels, but there's all sorts of new technologies out there that are going out uh, that are mapping the seafloor, either unmanned or manned. And these new technologies are the way we think that we're going to be able to make that uh, 2030 target. So let's talk about the progress to date. Uh, the, there was a press release on the weekend that's basically announced the official release of the JEBCO 2020 grid. Every year, JEBCO is releasing a new grid. Um, every year. So this year, we've just released a 2020 grid. Unfortunately for GNS, they use the 2019 grid for their new map products, so they're going to have to update their products with the latest data. But um, so the, the new grid's being released. Now, the new grid that's being released is at a 15 art second resolution, which is about 400 meter uh, pixel size. But the ambition for the GEPO 2030 project is to actually work at a variable resolution. So depending on your depth band, um, the resolution will change, and this is all based on what a modern echo sounder on, on, a, uh, on a vessel will retrieve. So in shallow waters, having resolutions ideally of 100 meters for a mapping product, and as you get into deeper waters, that would go up to 800 meters. So if we look at the top um, right-hand slide, that is the uh, bathymetry of our region, the South and West Pacific. By the year 2030, I'd like to be able to point to that map and saying that's it, that's real data. Right now, um, if you look at the bottom two maps on the left was the JEPCO 2019 product. And all we are showing on, the, on, on these bottom two slides is where there is real data. Where there is black, it's the power of computers and, and algorithms to generate uh, model synthesis. So 2019 is shown on the bottom left. 2020, we can see we have expanded a lot more. That is actually the real data that has gone into this year's release. So in terms of progress overall, when we started this project in 2017, 6% of the oceans actually had real sounding data behind them. In 2019, we got that up to 15%. And this year, we're pleased to announce that we're actually up to, sorry, 2019 we're up to 15, yes. And this year, we're pleased to announce that we got up to 90% of the ocean actually have real data behind that. Now, we've broken these statistics down into the, the um, gold resolutions that we're hoping for. So in the different color bands, um, that shows you actually the percentage covered uh, depending on the depth band. So in 2019, we can actually see that 100 meter resolution, which is shallow water, we've got a significant amount there. But most of the data that's been collected by far is that middle band, which is 400 meter resolution. And what this means is that people who they share us uh, their, da their data to us are sharing to us at a very low resolution. Um, and so that's for the future plannings, we're going to go back to those people who have shared us data and say, can you please give it to us at a much higher resolution in order to make those targeted bands. For those who are really observant, you know, it's in 2019, solid blue. That's because we didn't run the uh, statistics calculations at those resolution bands. Because in 2019, we moved from a 13 arc second product, which is a thout, which is one kilometer grid, to a uh, 15 arc second product. So we went to a higher resolution and we were just worried about getting that new resolution out and didn't carry out those statistics. So what does it mean for New Zealand? On the left, we have the extended continental shelf as shown by the JEPCO 2018 product. And on the right is what's just been released today under the 2020. It's not much to see at that resolution, but there are some critical differences. You will notice that on the left, um, the continental shelf is really poorly mapped. It looks quite lumpy and bumpy, which is very classic from satellite derived bathymetry. Um, there's also some quite a few uh, artifacts. There's a, there's a track line artifact extending from Northland. That's quite clearly bad data. There's bad data very obvious in the, in the Challenger Plateau. And there's also some bad data in the Kaikoura Canyon. 
they have gone now in the 2020 product. Um, our New Zealand continental shelf is um, far superior than what it was from even uh, last year. Um, and, and the devil's in the details. So when you look at the details um, from the ECS, the difference that we've had this year from even last year was we've had much more data collected around the coastlines and in the near shore. So the Jebco 2020 product around New Zealand is much more accurate in, in those continental shelf areas and in areas close to land. So in terms of percent coverage for the New Zealand region, this is just in terms of the, the counting of the number of cells in our product. Um, we can actually see in terms of direct measurements, we're looking at about 35% of the New Zealand ECS actually has a direct sounding behind that. Um, and the, the remainder has come from either interpolation from paper charts and contours. Then we consider the global average is 19. This is actually a very good number. If we looked at the ECS, so we're zooming in a bit more, we actually see right now we're actually getting closer to 40% of the ECS actually has real data behind that. So as a country, we've still got a long way to go to make that 100% target. The big improvement too, actually, I should point out from this year versus last year is that we, um, we've also included a lot more single beam soundings and ENC data that came in too. So ENC now is, and, and single beam soundings are, play a significant role. They were never included in any of previous release of the JEPCO products. So, to finish off, what do we ask for you? So first of all, um, we know that the seabed is very, very important. Um, we've all seen these slides before, but why we should actually map the sea floor. So we ask that please, um, we encourage your organizations to share data basically. And if you have shared data with us, please share it to us at, at, a, at the highest resolution that you possibly can. Um, there's different ways that you can share to us. You can either contact us directly, um, but there's actually now a website that's just, just been created, seabed 2030jebgonet slash contributions that will tell you um, how to how to contribute data. Uh, that's a new website that's just been created. Bottom line, please share your data. And I know there's lots of agencies in New Zealand that we currently are not having access to that data. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for that, Kevin. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now to uh, um, do the wrap up. Um, and um, so say thank you to GNS for uh, hosting this event and uh, for all the speakers from, from GNS, but also to Neva and uh, Kevin. So Vaughan and Jenny, thank you very much um, for hosting uh, this event, this celebration of World Hydrography Day. Um, so my impressions uh, from what I've seen, uh, I guess, uh, is uh, sort of a wow factor in some of uh, the bathymetry now we can see in the tectonics. And um, I really want to uh, get in and uh, have a look at that data um, via the web browser. Uh, and I'm given some comfort that uh, oldies can uh, access it and use it as well. Um, so, so that's a good thing. So thank you for providing us with the twins, um, as they were called. I think it also shows the collaboration and partnership within New Zealand um, and um, within our communities that we have. Um, and I think we ought to uh, value that and, and reflect on what we do, although it is challenging in terms of uh, some of the work we do. Um, I think that the result uh, is uh, well worthwhile. So um, I think for, for New Zealand then, the science, the mapping that we do, um, we are leading the world and Kevin will make that point in terms of Seabed 2030 um, and what we're delivering in terms of our centre compared to other centres um, in our innovation and delivery. So um, I say thank you very much um, for your attention. Uh, Narera, uh, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato kato. And I'll hand back to Tanya. <laughs> So my final task of today is to close as we did open with Karakia. So kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atawai o tō tātou ari ki a iho kareiti. Me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tehitanga ki te wairua tapu a ke ake ake amene.